we're walking toward the packaging area. This facility is about uh, 50,000 square feet on the first floor, plus we have a mezzanine. It gets pretty noisy back here. We bottle at the rate of 250 bottles per minute, about four bottles per second. Uh, we label at the same rate. This is truth. Uh, we do hold these truths to be self-evident. <laughs> so why is it cold? Uh, you have to bottle beer cold, otherwise the CO2 comes out of solution. The, we want the CO2 in the beer, so we bottle almost at like mid-30 degrees, so the CO2 stays in there, it's very stable. Uh, the, um, the truth about this, full disclosure on this beer is that we saw an opportunity to add a beer to our portfolio and sell a little extra beer. That's the full disclosure on this package. This was, this was Ralph Stedman, an example of one of those characters that might not always tell the truth, but in fact, our full disclosure says, this bear came to fruition because we saw a gap in our portfolio and we wanted to increase our market share. <laughs> I love that, that's awesome. You're, you're like a capitalist or something. I'm like a, I'm like a capitalist. You will never get a fresher truth, so feel free to take that with you. Tell me a little bit about the, the process here because there's a lot of really disruptive beers here. There's things that some marketing executive at some big corporation would say, why would you ever sell that? No one's gonna buy it. How do you guys decide? I'm often asked the question, do I run a libertarian company? As if, as if you can step out of being a libertarian and go and run your company. So even though I don't talk about this a lot, uh, one of the things, one of the many operating principles here at Flying Dog is people must think for themselves and we demand it. And we demand that if you're doing that, you'll sometimes fail. So you wanna push your genius to the edge. Everything interesting is at the edge. So our beers are created. Uh, every year we go up to the state park. Everybody here has two minutes to pitch a beer idea. A lot of other breweries, there's one person and that's where the beers come from. And then out of the 126 pitch this year, we pick eight. And our goal is to always find creative ways to combine ingredients. It's like literature, everything Every story that could possibly have been told in the history of the world has been told, but you can always say it freshly. So as we combine uh, tamarind and uh, uh, nutmeg and habanero and mole chocolate and so forth, we come up with these wonderful expressions of creativity and craft beer uh, that brings people together. And that's at the edge. So we'll do 47 beers this year. At least 10 will be beers we've never done before. What's up with the, the cask? Are you barrel aging some stuff here? Besides the fact that barrels are one of the most beautiful inventions of mankind, I just love touching them and looking at them. It hasn't changed for hundreds of years. We age beer in barrels, uh, both barrels that have at one time had tequila or rum, whiskey, white or red wine in it, but also just wood barrels. These are called foders. Yeah. It's just raw wood that will change over time as different beers go through. The lifetime on one of those is about 10 or 12 years. And with each beer, the wood is picking up different characteristics, which then imparts to the next beers that come into it. We're always tasting. Uh, there's no set time. So as we sample the beers, as they age in the barrels, we know when it's just right, uh, pull it out and bottle it. Almost always sold just here at the tap room at Flying Dog. Did you ever put Gonzo in a, in a bourbon barrel or something like that? Oh, to die for. Barrel aged, call it bag, barrel aged Gonzo. Oh, really? It is to die for. People will line up down the sidewalk during those releases. So I need the alert on that one. You need the alert on that one for sure. So you got, you got two things. So You're, I'm kind of passionate about you, this. You, <laughs> yeah, I'm sensing a little bit of passion here. And you got two things going on. You're like, you got the this, this disruptive uh, screw there, guys. We're going to try this. We're going to make it work. We're going to make it happen, which I think is, is characteristic of the craft beer industry. It's, it's something that no one ever took seriously, and now it's this, this force, not just in the alcohol industry, but in, in civil society. And then you have this sort of uh, philosophy that says, I'm going to play by the rules that say we should, we should be free to do what we want as long as we don't hurt people or take their stuff. Where, where does that philosophy come from? Uh, my philosophy comes from objectivism. Uh, just to comment on, on a point you made, we, I'm not sure this connection is always made. We view freedom of expression and free enterprise as inextricably linked. 
uh, I, don't, I think there should be more freedom of, uh, of expression and there should be no differences between commercial free speech and individual free speech. So when you attempt to suppress my ability to communicate with my consumers, you're effectively anti-free enterprise. My marketing message is built into this bottle, the art, the name, uh, the description and so forth. So if you are free enterprise and you believe the consumer is sovereign and consumer choice, you cannot suppress freedom of expression. Uh, objectivism, uh, the weekend of July 21st, 1977, I picked up a copy of Atlas Shrugged and 100 pages into it, I couldn't put it down. So in this espresso fueled weekend from Thursday night to Sunday morning, I read Atlas Shrugged and I wanted to be in that world. Uh, it described a society free, people trading voluntarily, uh, minimum regulation, a society based on property rights, contracts, restitution, peace, self-defense, but peace, uh, not taking other people's property by force. And I wanted to be in that world. And the message, I didn't know what objectivism was, didn't get deep enough into it at that point over the decades I have. But the point is that, and I took this away, that you can accept the world the way it is, or you can live in the world that you want it to be. And you can adopt free enterprise principles and not get into special interest politics and crony capitalism and play that game. You live by the political sword, you die by the political sword. And you can't be a virgin except for Saturday nights. You know, once you're in that game, once you've sold your soul to it, you can no longer just pass people in the street and say, I'm for free enterprise. And it has implications, it has consequences, but you can stand for something or stand for shit. But by the time you're 30 or 40, you're looking back on your life, wondering where your soul dried up. And I will never do that. The story of where the name Flying Dog came from, which was from the Flashman Hotel in Rawalpindi, Pakistan in 1983. George Stranahan, a, a true Renaissance man, PhD in physics, founded the Aspen Center for Physics when he was still an undergrad, professional photographer, professional artist, uh, founded the Woody Creek Tavern, a rancher, took 13 innocent people to Rawalpindi, Pakistan, decided they want to climb K2, the most dangerous mountain in the world. One out of four people who try to climb it die. They had no mountain climbing experience. It's the only major mountain without a name. It's in the Karakoram Range, K1, K2, K3. It's never been climbed in the winter. They land in Rawalpindi. They find some Sherpas to guide them up the mountain. On day 37, they run out of alcohol. That's not to deter them. They pressed on. Uh, later back at the Flashman Hotel in Rawalpindi, they see this painting on the wall, a beautiful painting of kind of like an English Spaniel, but in a position you've never seen a dog. It's four legs in front of it, its ears blown back, its hind legs tucked up underneath it. Uh, Lester Thoreau, the famous economist, was with them on the trip. This was Gaylord Gwennon's room. The best they could figure out was a local misunderstood the concept of English bird dog. The English had inhabited Pakistan during the Raj. And so they named this the flying dog. The first time in the English language those two words were put together. And it just became this, this spirit of who we all are. And that is maybe if nobody tells you that dogs can't fly, maybe you can believe that. Maybe you can actually not let that little voice in the back of your head tell you that you're not good enough to live your dream. Live the world as you would like it to be, not as it is. Do you ever look at yourself in the mirror in the morning and say, this is so cool, I get to make awesome beer for a living? I am just happy. I have a great life and I'm happy. Uh, I'm cheerful and optimistic and yes. And it's partly because I live my life with the principles of individual liberty, taking responsibility, accepting that there are consequences and implications, knowing that if I'm always thinking, I can correct the path. So it's not about a goal, it's about a direction. And my purpose in life is building and growing businesses, creating stuff. And so when you're doing that, it's exciting, it's fun. I've lost millions of dollars. Uh, you know, it's, that's, that's, what, that's what you do. Uh, there is no greater feeling than knowing that you're exercising your thinking, your brain power to the maximum extent possible. And I'm surrounded by a tremendously talented team of people here. So it is just pure fun. My goal is to be the best part of your day, Matt. We were talking earlier about um, the, the anti-free speech um, philosophy coming from, from the social justice warriors today. What's, what's the origins of this? Why are they afraid of people speaking their mind? It used to be that, that liberals very much embraced the idea 
that, that speech was something that everyone had a right to? Now, that is a great question, and I, I do have the opportunity to speak on college campuses. I'm, I'm a brewer, uh, so that gives me a certain, well, let's, let's hear what he has to say. Uh, and I do have the opportunity to speak with a lot of friendly groups, whether it's uh, IHS, uh, Students for Liberty, and so forth. Uh, I see three things. One is there's a lot of peer pressure to shut down any ideas that they find disagreeable. The old freedom of speech for, for me, but not for thee, you know, that these ideas are unacceptable. And there's a lack of understanding that with every freedom comes a responsibility. The responsibility of freedom of speech is tolerance, that if you want freedom of speech for you, other people have their opinions, and that's how you make progress towards some truth or, you know, moving the conversation forward. Uh, second is there is a extraordinary phenomenon that seems to be dialogue is evil. Dialogue is a tool of the oppressor against the oppressed. It used to be the haves versus the have-nots under Marxism, that utterly failed system, you know. Uh, now it's more uh, the oppressors versus the oppressed and language and dialogue uh, will trick you into believing stuff you don't want to believe. And I think that message is fairly effective. So even, so the shouting down and the heckler's veto is simply not even to engage in dialogue not even looking at it, that there's a possibility that if you're talking to a rational person that we have a lot in common, it's simply shutting down that dialogue. It's extraordinarily dangerous. So there must be some lesson in there because <laughs> we're, we're struggling with, with how, do we, how do we sell young people on the ideas of liberty? Because yes. we're at this, this moment where you know, they're looking at uh, the left and they weren't so much into Hillary. They're looking at the right, they weren't so much into Trump. What's, you're, you're a salesman. Like, how do we sell liberty to this next generation? You're asking the most important question because these are the people, our future leaders, the, the people that are going to be in positions of influence. Uh, I think there's two ways. One is a basic understanding of what the constitu what our founding documents are, what those principles are behind it. Unfortunately, many young people don't even realize there's a difference between the executive, legislative, and judicial. So I think there's an extraordinary lack of teaching about American history, why America is unique among countries, uh, why capitalism is the most ethical moral system out there. Uh, I think we just need to break free of what has become a uh, pretty much a conscious effort not to educate people in schools these days. Yeah. It's unfortunate. So without an understanding of those principles, when you talk about freedom as opposed to what? It all sounds pretty good if it's not, if it's taken out of context. So this context dropping is extremely dangerous to society. You said earlier that, that young people really don't want to be told what to think. They want, they want to buy into something. They want to feel like it was their decision. They're like, if they're going to choose a flying dog beer versus the next beer, they're like, that's what I want. It's not what I was told to do, that's what I want. That, that's another great point. Uh, I think that kind of relates to everybody likes to buy, whether it's products or ideas. Nobody likes to be sold to. Nobody likes to be told your ideas are wrong. And the best way to do this is paint, hold that thought, picture this if you will. Visualize another world. Visualize a free society. Visualize Galt's Gulch. And think about that for a moment. And that's when you can move people forward. Libertarianism has a bad rap as being right-wing conservative. And that gets stigmatized with all this social divisiveness and so forth. People need to step back and just talk about individual liberty and the joy of living with the pursuit of happiness as being a worthy goal. Now for us, of course, that's a rational pursuit of happiness. And I, I've said this before, you may know, I believe it's the only founding document in the history of the world that has the word happiness in it. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's no guarantee, but as you mentioned before, it's not a goal, it's I'm moving in the direction of happiness. I'm going through life cheerfully and optimistic, knowing that whatever's thrown my way, I've got the resources that whatever I'm doing to apply my brain power to it, to make the situation a little bit better, which means a little bit more in the direction of, of the way I want my world to go. It's a joy that you, you can't even describe until you've been in that situation. Thanks, Matt. Thank you so much.